As Mike mentioned earlier, my name is Jim George. I'm also one of the elders here at Grace Point, and uh, I get the, the pleasure of sharing, thing, sharing with you a little bit about God's Word. But first, we've got to address Mike's story about missing church last week. I mean, that was sweet and all, that whole spur each other on, but he skipped church, right? I mean, that's not okay, I don't think. So when you see Mike, you might say, hey, thanks for the encouragement, but, uh, you know, you've got to come to church on Sunday morning. Well, it is, a, it is a pleasure for me to be up here this morning and to share with you a little bit about what God has to say inside this book of Nehemiah, one that we're starting, uh, we're just starting this morning. Um, Pam and I have been coming to Grace Point now for about uh, 23, 4, 5 years, something like that. Uh, before we were here, we lived in Southern California, and when you live in Southern California, you get to do some really cool things. One of the things that I got to do, this would be late 80s, early 90s, is I got to meet President Reagan and President Bush. President Bush, the first President Bush, he was the president at the time, and Reagan had just wrapped up his, his second term. And it was, um, it was just the three of us. We got to chat. It wasn't very long. It was like seven, ten minutes, something like that. A short meeting. In fact, they might not even remember the meeting. I don't know. I mean, it was that short. But, um, <laughs> but I'm still talking about it uh, 15 years later or whatever it's been. Anyway, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was just a little bit of a chat, but, and I don't even remember that much about the meeting, but what I remember is what I was thinking about as the day went on. And what I was thinking about as the day went on is that, yeah, they, they started the day, it was about 10 or 11, talking to a schmo like me, but, that the, but for the rest of their day, they were going to go on and just have a normal day for them. It was just going to be a regular day for them. No, it wouldn't be a normal day for us probably, but for them it was just a normal, typical day. But in that normal, typical day, they were going to do ordinary things that whatever ex-presidents and presidents do, but whatever those things were, were going to have some pretty significant implications. And I, and I was thinking to myself that day, I was like, you know, that would be really cool. It would be really cool to live a life that, that you do things over the course of a day that have enormous implications. And being the leader of the free world, I guess you get to do that. Well, it turns out you get to do that as any kind of leader. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes thinking about leaders. So if you could, just in your mind, think about, if I were to ask you, who is the greatest leader to have ever lived? Right? Jesus is not the answer. You're not allowed to, it's got to be 100% man, 0% deity. But who is, the, who is the greatest leader to really ever live? Someone come to, someone come to mind? A couple people come to mind. All right, now think about who, who, is the, who would be the greatest leader that's actually on the earth now, walking the earth now. Who would you say, who are some of the greatest leaders? We had a name. Who? Lincoln. Lincoln. Okay, he would have to be on the list, right? Okay, so what about people that you know? Your own relationship, your friends, your neighbors, coworkers, people you know. Who would you say of that group, of the people that are on your contact list on your phone, who is the greatest leader in that group? Wouldn't it be cool? In a room this size, there's probably a whole bunch of names and faces that are kind of coming up. Wouldn't it be cool if we could, get, if we could have a room and put all of those people, those people that we all just thought of, put, a, put all those people in one room? It'd, it'd have to be a pretty big room, um, but it would be, I mean, it could, maybe there'd be a thousand people in that room. And imagine if you got to be in that room with them. So it's you and a thousand of the best leaders that have ever been. And you got to have a pad of paper, and you got to talk to, or you got to interview all of these people. And you, were, you could ask them like really insightful questions about what, it became, what it's like to be a leader, or how do you make your decisions, and, and you're jotting down all of this information, and then you take that information, you go back to your computer, and you load all that data in, and, and you do some kind of regression analysis, or some, somehow, boom, you end up with the key traits to great leadership. Like, having talked to all of these people, you come up with the, you, you, the, the list of things that if you want to be a great leader, you follow these things. Pretty cool, right? Then if you take that and you gave it to somebody and you said, here, this is what I did. Look at this. Look at this list of great traits of great leaders. And they say, you nailed it. You hit it. That's exactly what great leadership is. That's exactly what we're, what great le- how you would describe and get to great leadership. But... We were hoping for something a little bit more, something more, something more than great leadership. You know, we've titled this sermon, Beyond Great Leadership. Why is that? It's because great leadership isn't enough. Great leadership is actually too low a bar. It's far too low a bar. And why is that? 
Well, the reason is because if you go back to the definition of leadership, if you go down to the definition of leader in its purest sense, what's a leader? It's a person that influences, or it's a person that generates followers. That's what they do, right? Who's a teacher? A teacher is somebody that causes someone to learn. Who's a leader? It's someone that causes someone to follow or that influences. And so with that definition of leadership, who else is on that list of great leaders? I mean, I don't know who all bubbled up in your mind, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right? FDR, he was a great leader. Someone may have thought of Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, all great leaders. Winston Churchill, great leader. But who else is on that list? If your definition is people that influence or people that cause followers, then who else is on that list? Saddam Hussein is on that list. Adolf Hitler is on that list. Fidel Castro, David Koresh, these are people that did evil things. What they did was evil, how they did it was evil, but make no mistake, they were influencers, and they caused people to follow. So in that definition, in that respect, they too were great leaders. What they did was horrible. What some of them did was horrible. So if good leadership isn't enough, if great leadership isn't enough, then what is it that we're really looking for? What is beyond great leadership? The way to measure effectiveness is whether they are godly leaders. Godly leaders goes beyond great leaders. So I gave you some examples. So there's some extreme examples of evil people, but, but we know some people like this. They may not be that extreme, but think of the schoolyard bully. Think of the guy, that the kid, the, the eight, eighth grade kid that walks around with four or five other kids walking around school just picking on the, the younger kids or the weaker kids. A leader? Yeah. Influences? Yeah. Has some followers? He does. Or some of you that have been in the workforce, you, you might have had a boss like this. Now, I've got to tell you, by and large, I've had awesome bosses. Most of my career, I've loved my bosses, and, and they've been terrific. But there is one, when I think about it, that comes to mind as clearly my least favorite. Now, Wall Street loved the guy. He did a great job. He was, when it comes to Wall Street, when it comes to our stock price, he did a phenomenal job. And when he was in front of all employee meetings, he was the charmingest, sweetest guy ever. But in his conference room, he was always angry. He was always yelling. Always vulgar. So while he went out and got a great strike, uh, 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 price, uh, stock price for us, he was also leaving a wake of upset, angry people and a corporate culture that actually never got any better. A great leader, a lot of people thought so. A great leader, Wall Street thought so. But people that knew him saw something different. We need godly leaders. We need people that we can not only follow, but people that we can actually admire. And if you want to know what godly leadership looks like, if you want to see godly leadership, you don't need a room full of Mandelas and Reagans and Thatchers and Alexander the Greats. All you need to do is open up the Old Testament and go to the book of Nehemiah. And if you want to see what great godly leadership looks like, then I want you to stand with me in honor of God's word. We're going to the book of Nehemiah. It's in the Old Testament, if you're looking for it. If you're in Psalms or Proverbs, you're too far. You've got to back up to the left a little bit. If you want to start at the beginning and you go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? And then you've got Judge, uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Then you've got all the ones and twos, right? Go through all the ones and twos. Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. And then you get to Ezra. Right next to Ezra is Nehemiah. In fact, at one point, some thought Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. But everybody there? Nehemiah? Okay, we're going to go through Nehemiah 1, 1 through 4, and then we're going to skip all the way to the bottom of that chapter, the end of verse 11, okay? Nehemiah 1, 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, what happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them about the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept 
and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then, and then he prays. It's a beautiful prayer, but skip through all of that. Go to the end of 11. And then it says this kind of peculiar sentence all by itself. It says, now I was cupbearer to the king. Let's pray. Father God, as we, as we start this study on Nehemiah and, and open up this first few verses on this first chapter, uh, we look at a story of a man who is hearing some news, some bad news, some news that breaks his heart. And Father, we see his response and we see his reaction, and I pray, God, that as we go through that today, that we would see in that what you would have for us. I pray that any word I say that isn't from you is just not even heard by anybody. I pray, Father, though, that the insight that you have put in here for us this morning is expressed clearly. God, we love you, and we pray in your son's name. Have a seat. So a little bit of background. We're kicking off this new series, this new series in uh, Nehemiah. Um, this book is widely, if you haven't heard, is, is widely regarded as one of the best studies on leadership in the Bible, and in some cases and, and anywhere else as well. Um, over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be going through this book, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll agree that it is a great study on godly leadership. The book of Nehemiah is not part of the law. Those first five books, it's not part of the law. There's no poetry in this book. There's no prophecy. Nehemiah was neither a major nor a minor prophet. This is a history book. And if, but don't worry, if you're, if you're like me and you're not a history buff at all, Derek is a bit of a history buff, I am not. Um, but don't worry, it is a historical account of a great movement of God. Something that is very exciting and fun to watch. The timing of this takes place several hundred years before Christ. In fact, the book was written about 400 BC, but the events that we read about were about 40 or 50 years prior to that. But before we even get to that context, we want to back even further. Um, as we know, the nation of Israel was started with Abraham, right? God started that nation with Abraham, um, and at, as it began, it, was, it began as a theocracy, which means their king was God. But they looked around over the course of time, they noticed, well, these other countries, they have gods that they can see and touch and feel and hear from, and we want a god like that. So God said, well, I don't know if you really want that. They said, no, 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 we really do. And they said, okay, here's a king. So they got King Saul, and then they got King David, and then they got King Solomon, right? Solomon, during Solomon's reign, that's when the temple was built, and these walls that we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks were all built then. Well, Solomon was also the last king of a united Israel. So Israel was all put together, right? And then after Solomon, it broke apart, right? It was divided. That king was divided. There were 10 tribes up in the north, two down in the south. That's where Judah was. That's where Jerusalem was, was down in the south. About 75 years after that division, um, the Assyrians came in and, and wiped out the northern kingdom. And then about 115 years or so after that, the Babylonians came in and cleared out the southern kingdom, right? Cleaned up Judah, not cleaned up, took over Judah. And that was King Nebuchadnezzar. And in the process of doing that, totally destroyed the walls that we're going to be talking about and destroyed the temple. Eventually, the Persians take over, right, from the Babylonians. And when they do that, the Persians captivate people a little bit differently than the, than the Babylonians did. They allowed a little bit more religious freedom. So they took, or they allowed a few Jews, lots of Jews, to go back to Jerusalem and start the rebuilding of the temple. That, that effort was led by Zerubbabel, all right? And that went on for a couple of years. Zerubbabel, good guy, worked for two years on the temple, but got scared away, never finished, didn't finish the temple. So he was done. Then about 70 years after that, another king, uh, King Darius, also a Persian king, he said, you know, we got to go finish the job, sent some more Jews over there. Eventually the, the, uh, the temple was, was, was fixed, was repaired, was rebuilt. And you can read about that celebration in Ezra 6. That all brings us up to Nehemiah. Okay, short history lesson, very short. So it's been 100 years. So now we're at Nehemiah. It's been about 100 years since the very first effort to go clean up the temple began. The temple is there. It's been rebuilt, and there's people from all over worshiping at that temple. However, the walls have not been rebuilt. The walls around the city are still in rubble. Why is that important? Why is that relevant? Well, there's at least two reasons that, that, that this is relevant. First is, th those walls back then, the walls defined, it was the boundary, it was kind of the point of demarcation. You know, in Naperville, we go in and we see a sign that says, welcome to Naperville. That's how you know you're in Naperville. Well, in Jerusalem, you found out because you were at the walls. Okay, but in this case, the walls were rubble. And so it's hard to have a king over a kingdom when there's no boundaries. If there's no kingdom, there's no king. 
So for boundaries, for points of demarcation, it was, op- it was helpful to have those walls. But there's another reason, maybe a more significant reason, and that is that at that time, those walls were for protection. I mean, literal protection. Not a figure. T- this was to keep the enemies from, other- from coming in. They would have these walls. Well, in this case, there were no walls. There was no protection. The city of Jerusalem was naked. But today we're not embarking on a study of building a wall, although we've got a nice wall. Uh, It's not a study about walls, really. It's a study of an ordinary person working with ordinary people, doing a relatively ordinary task that had extremely extraordinary implications. Why is that relevant? That's relevant because that is our calling as well. We are all ordinary people, tasked with doing a lot of ordinary things. But if we do them in a godly way, there will be extraordinary implications. For Nehemiah, it was a wall. For us, it is probably something else. It probably isn't a wall, but it is something. Do you know that? Do you know that God has something significant for you and for me to accomplish? And we're to do it just in our normal course of a day. My daughter, some of you know my daughter Emily, she is studying at North Central College to be a teacher. And part of that, actually when she was in high school, she took this class where you went to an elementary school and you sat in on a class. And her job was really to observe. Her job was to really kind of sit there and watch the teacher and take good notes, I guess. But what happened, well, there was one day when she was there and the teacher was going through a spelling lesson and, and Emily was there and she was watching and she was observing and the teacher eventually came over and said, hey, how, how do you think it's going? And Emily said, well... There's a few kids in here that I don't think they get it. I don't think they're following you. And the teacher, and the teacher, she is a great teacher. But she, you know what she said? She said, yeah, well, that's kind of how it is sometimes. Some kids just don't, there's always some kids that just don't get it. It's part of having a class. And then Emily said, well, which of the kids do you think gets it the least? She said, oh, that's this guy. And Emily said, do you mind if I just spend time with him? And the teacher was like, Sure, whatever, go right ahead. Well, so Emily spends a little time. It wasn't a big investment of time. It was probably about 20 minutes, but helped this kid through this spelling lesson that they were in. And it turns out the kid got an A on the spelling test. Great story, right? Turns out the kid had never gotten an A ever. Turns out the kid was so excited about this first A that he was crying. It's like a little kid. He's crying because he got an A. Who cries because they get an A? I wouldn't know. I have no idea. I'm still waiting for my first one. Okay, but, but he did, so, and he, he said, Miss Emily, can I call my mom? I mean, what a sweet, what a sweet, now, what did Emily do? Something huge? No. She's there, she's in a classroom with a bunch of kids, and her job was to watch the teacher. But what she did, she did that, and in addition to that, she invested 15 minutes, 20 minutes into this kid, and, 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 and helped him. Now, the traje- it turns out, now this is a couple years ago, I don't know where this kid is now, but the trajectory of that guy's, that little kid studying, cha- that was a huge inflection point for them. And he went on to have the best semester he's ever had. Now, we have no idea what's happened to the guy. I don't know if he's doing, still doing great or what, I don't know. But, but Emily just did something. Now, why did she do that? She didn't know the kid. She just loved what she was doing and loved people in general and invested a little time in this kid that may have changed the trajectory of all his education. Anyway, that's Emily. We all have our own things that we should be doing. This lesson, this sermon is really for the leaders in the group, which means this sermon, this lesson is for everyone in the room. Okay, some of us might be, we might have the the luxury of leading dozens of people or hundreds of dozens of people, or some of us might just be leading our own life. But in either case, we are leading, we have influence even if it's over ourselves, but we have influence and we, ha- we cause people to follow, even if it's ourselves. So I'm hopeful that you don't look at this and say, oh, leadership, mm, I can tune out. No, no, this, this, is, this is for all of us. Maybe you're here today with the ability to influence a lot or maybe just yourself, but in any case, what we cover over the next six weeks or so is going to be helpful. We're going to be talking about discovering a call, how Nehemiah discovers a call that he gets from God. We're going to talk about what he does with that. We're going to talk about how he relates to the people around him, kind of his sphere of influence. We're also going to talk about what happens when there is opposition to what he's trying to accomplish. And we're going to talk about, in the final week, on on what he honors. What does he honor? What does he value most throughout all of this? And we'll see that pattern happening. 
But today's message is called Discovering God's Call. And we've titled it that because that's what happens in these first four verses. Nehemiah discovers his calling from God. Now, wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think okay, we're about to watch a person discover their calling from God. You'd expect angels or Paul Michael on the organ or somebody with the harp, right? We're going to discover this calling from God. Well, it turns out that isn't really what happens. The way it looks like it, it's just a guy at home or at work having a little conversation with some people that come in. It looks pretty normal. It looks like maybe any conversation we might have. Some people walk, you're at work, you're at home, somebody walks in and says, hey, what's going on? Oh, I'm doing fine. Hey, how, how is so-and-so doing? Oh, not well. It's not doing well. Oh, really? That's too bad. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray for him. All right? Or, or oh, I'm going to pray for him. That's too bad. If there's anything I can do, let me know. I'm happy to, I'm, I'm happy to help if there's something I can. But that isn't, that isn't really what happens. Well, let's go back to verse 4. If you still got your finger open to Nehemiah 1, go back to that verse 4. It says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Don't you read that and wonder, when was the last time you wept and mourned for days? When was the last time I heard news that was so jolting it just stopped me in what I was doing? When was the last time I was profoundly impacted by somebody else's concern? And I wonder, well, if it's, if it's been a while, what would it take? What would it take for my heart to be so broken that I would shelve my own agenda to address it. What would it take? Well, from these verses, I think it takes at least three things. First, it takes a heart for the heart of God. It also takes a, 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 an acknowledgement that you actually can serve. And then finally, it takes a, a response. Not just any response, a humble response steeped in humility. A heart for the heart of God. That's the first thing that it takes. When you think of a heart, what do you think of? Love. Right? I mean, Valentine's Day cards, it's all about love. They all have these hearts on it. If you've got your smartphone and you're sending emojis, a love emoji, it always has the heart on it, right? Even Justin Bieber, when he's trying to tell his fans he loves them, right? He's got the heart hand. The heart represents love. Well, if the heart represents love, how much more so does the heart of God? If you go to 1 John 4, 8, it says, Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Later on it says, God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So we understand that God has a lot of traits, right? There's a lot of ways you can describe God, but God is love. So one of the reasons, one of our core values here is love shapes character. In the New Testament, Jesus is asked once, well, of all these commandments, man, there's a lot of rules. Which one is the most significant one? We all know it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment, right? And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So having a heart for the heart of God means loving, loving him and loving others. And when you love others, you're sensing their needs, Is that you? Do you love enough to sense others' needs? Are you in God's word? Your love for God draws you to God's word so that you can read it and get get to know him more and get to know this design even more. Is that you? Do you pray not because you're about to eat a meal, but because you want to spend time with Almighty? You want to talk to and hear from God himself. Is that you? When you hear about others that are going through difficulties, are you hurt? Does your heart break? Parents know this, but when you love someone, you often want more for them than they want for themselves. We often sense people's needs. If you love people, you'll sense needs maybe more than they will. You know, sometimes we pray that God would bring people in our path with specific needs that we can address. He's already done that. 
It's just a question of whether we've noticed. You know, there are people in our lives that are struggling. There are people in our lives that are struggling with finances or they're struggling with relationships. There are people in our lives that are lonely. There are people in our lives that wonder if life is even worth living. You know, if our church is typical, there are people in this room right now with those same struggles. And I often ask myself, and tonight I get to, or this morning I get to stand up and, and ask you, do you love people enough to even notice? Nehemiah did, right? Nehemiah loved those people so much. Did you, did you catch that? When, the, when his brother comes in with these other guys, Nehemiah doesn't just chat and say, hey, bro, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? How are things? What are you up to? He was very quick to ask, how are the Jews? How is Jerusalem? Remember the question? What would it take for my heart to be so broken that I shelve my own agenda to address it? Well, it takes a heart for the heart of God. It takes a deep love for him and for his people. But that's just a start. We also need to know that we are capable to serve. But in Naperville, we have a problem, right? We're really, really busy, right? I've got a job that sucks 60 hours of my week every single week. I'm on a board of some corporate company in downtown. I sit on a board for a 501c3 in the suburbs. I've got kids that are playing sports. I've got to go coach their teams. I want to watch as many Cubs playoff games as I possibly can. I'm too busy to listen to your problems, let alone do anything about them. I'm a little embarrassed how easy that was to say. Maybe it's not busyness for you. Maybe not you're too busy. Maybe it's just you don't feel qualified. You know, I don't really know what my spiritual gift is yet. Until I figure that out, I'm not really going to do anything. Or I haven't really memorized enough verses. I mean, these Awana kids know more verses than I do. I, I probably can't step in and fill that gap. There's got to be someone else that can take care of children's church on that second hour. That's not, that's not for me. Is that you? Maybe it's not that you're too busy. Maybe it's not that you feel underqualified. Maybe you're just lazy. Maybe you just don't feel like it. I've used all of those excuses, and I've got more. And if I've missed your excuse, I apologize. I hope you'll forgive me. But I would like to point you and all your excuses right back into God's word and remember that God uses people that are just like that. God uses the too busy. God uses the unqualified. God uses the lazy if you'll let him. You know, God needed a patriarch. He went and grabbed Abraham, an old lying adulterer. Right? God needed to get his people into the promised land. He used Rahab, a prostitute. God needed someone to write a big chunk of the New Testament, so he went and got someone that hates churches or hated churches. And when Christ began his ministry, he needed 12 disciples. He could have gotten a dream team of people, but he got a dozen ordinary guys. Which brings us back to the text today. There's that pesky little sentence at the end of that prayer. It's a beautiful prayer, but then there's this last sentence that says, Now I was cup bearer to the king. Did it strike you that that doesn't really seem to fit? Like, why is that there? Why is that there? Now I was cupbearer to the king. I don't know why it's there. Here's what I do know. I do know that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that Jim and the other people at Grace Point could be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We know that's true. So then why is it there? I don't know for sure. But you need to know what a cupbearer is first. A cupbearer, he, he works for the king. He's on the court that, that works for the king. He's one of the servants. In some cases, he might even be the, the chief of the servants, but he's a servant. And his job, he's kind of like the butler of butlers. His job, he's got a bunch of jobs, but one of his jobs is to taste the wine and eat the food before the king does. 
Which means, yeah, it's a real good place of honor. But, you know what, if someone poisoned the wine, you're the first one we want dead. Literally every, literally every meal is a game of Russian roulette, right? Like they watch him and he sips it. I think I'm okay. Tries the food. Still alive. Now it gets to the king. That was his job. That's what a cupbearer does. So maybe it was there. Maybe that sentence is there. So that God could say, you know what? We use the unqualified. You know, it doesn't say, now I was general contractor to the king. Like a general contractor, you'd see, okay, why that guy goes and builds a wall, right? That makes sense. Or it could say, oh, I was priest to the king. You could see, okay, that guy's going to go lead that ministry. Or it could be, see, ah, he's, a, he's one of the servants and he's got a lot of time in his hands. You could see why that guy would be called to go build a wall. But he's none of those things. He's a cupbearer to the king. Why is it there? I don't know. Maybe it was just God wanted us to see that a man who is very busy, with a highly respected position, full of trust and authority, living in a palace, working among royalty, to keep the king alive, even that guy can leave a palace and go to the rubble. Even that guy can go lead a wall to be built. Remember the question. What would it take for my heart, for your heart, to be so broken that you were willing to shelve your own agenda to address it? Well, it would take a heart for the heart of God. It takes a lot of love. It also takes an understanding that if God's going to call you, he is going to equip you. But that's not at all. That's not all of it. It would also take the proper response, a humble response, a humble response steeped in humility. What, you know, if you think of Nehemiah in this story, what if Nehemiah hadn't responded? Or what if Nehemiah's response was, oh, I'm broken hearted. If there's anything I can do, let me know. And in other words, he didn't respond. What would have happened? What, what would happen if those walls never got rebuilt? Or what would happen if Nehemiah did, have, did respond, but he didn't respond with humility? Maybe he, he responded with pride. Do you ever do that? you ever have somebody come to you and say, hey, I've got this problem, and your immediate response, uh, response with pride would be, oh, well, let's go fix it. Let's, let's fix it. We can go fix it right now. Husbands are, tend to be notorious for this. I'm guilty of it myself. My wife and I, as some of you know, we, um, we work in UPS stores. We have two different stores. She works in one. I work in the other. So we have some of the same day when we come home and talk about it at night, but we're, we're separate throughout the day. One, about 10 years ago, she comes home from work, and she's all red and has been crying, very upset. It's like, Pam, what's wrong? It's like, oh, I was closing this store, and this lady came in, and she was very angry, and she's yelling at me, and it has nothing to do with us. She was mad about some other thing, and I helped her, and she did. She helped the customer. The customer, she was not upset about anything to do with the UPS, but, UPS store, but she was upset. Pam came home and, and continued to be upset and was telling me the story. And of course, I'm trying to help, and the I, I, first thing I tell her is that, Pam, you can't let stuff like this bother you. And then I told her how she should feel. <laughs> and then I told her how to better solve this next time. I thought she'd be delighted with my input. <laughs> she wasn't, right? Of course she wasn't. But that was my response, my response steeped with pride. But that's not what happens here. It could have been, right? Nehemiah could have said, oh, these Jews, I can't believe it. They don't have a wall. Listen, I can get this thing done. Let's get a bunch of people. We're heading out. We're going to go clean up this wall and get this. Like he could have done that, right? But that isn't what he did, right? What did he do? It's back in verse four. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That is a response. That's a response steeped in humility. That's a response with prayer. Like us, Nehemiah had core values. And like us, one of them was pray at all times. Along with weeping and mourning and fasting. That along with Nehemiah's other prayers are beautiful and are the subject of next week. This week was about discovering the call. How did Nehemiah do it? It wasn't some huge, supernatural, earth-shaking event. It was a simple conversation. It was news that he had gotten about people that he loved, and he responded 
by knowing that I can solve this? And he prayed. He was prepared. He was prepared to replace his own agenda with those of the people that he loves. What is it that broke his heart? When we read this, what is it that was he broken hearted because of these walls? It wasn't broken. That's old news. The walls were down. Why was he why was he broken hearted? It's because of the people. Without those boundaries, without that security, the people were a mess. That's what broke his heart. Why does he weep? He weeps because he loved. The walls were not built. People's risk, people's safety was at risk. And no one was doing anything about it. They were complacent. It was just, that's the way it is. Imagine these Jews in the, living in months the rubble. This was supposed to be their protection, and it wasn't. And they were complacent with it. You know, there are people in our lives that are living a life less than God would intend. And worse than that, they're okay with it. That should break your heart. That is what broke Nehemiah's heart. But that's how people are sometimes. They live a life that's less than what God intended. Pam and I were in the you know, I probably shouldn't have joked about Mike missing church last week because Pam and I missed church last week as well. <laughs> and we weren't cheering on our daughter. We were, on the, we were in the Florida Keys on vacation. But it was fun, and, and one of the days that was fun, we met a guy, well, Pam and I, we had this one afternoon that we needed to kill, so we, we went and we rented this Harley so that we could ride around the Well, it wasn't a Harley, it was, but it was, a big, it was a big motorcycle. And so we've... Actually, it wasn't a big motorcycle. It was a little scooter. It was like, we were on one of the, I think we got that thing up to like 20 miles an hour at one point, right? And so we were cruising around Key West, and, and we got to meet a bunch of people. And as we were turning the scooter back in, as we were turning the, just play along, as we were turning the Harley back in, um, I said to the guy, I said, so what's it like living in the Keys? What's it like living here? It must be pretty cool. And you know what he said? I want to get this right. Let me read you exactly what he said. He said, well, I'm just trying to live long enough to make it to happy hour tonight. And I have the same goal for tomorrow. I'm just trying to live long enough to make it to happy hour tonight, and I've got the same goal for tomorrow. He was joking, right? I mean, that can't really be true. It was. There was nothing wrong with him. Health-wise, there was nothing wrong with him. That was his goal. This is a guy living a life that's probably a little less than what God had intended. Do you have people around you that are doing that? Maybe this morning, you are that person. Maybe you're not the Nehemiah in the story that needs to go do something. Maybe... Maybe you're the person this morning that's living a life that's a little less than what God had intended. You need to know that God has designed you to do something significant. It's not going to feel extraordinary, but it's going to have extraordinary implications, or it could. Do you have a heart for the heart of God? Do you love him and love others? Do you know that you are equipped to serve and to help? And you know that the first response is not to just do it. The first response is on your knees. Because there's a lot of needs out there. You need to make sure the ones that you're solving for are the ones that God's actually designed for you.